Chapter 9, Enamel Formation. In this chapter, we're going to go into more detail about how enamel was formed. You do need to keep in the back of your mind the various early stages of tooth development, the placode, bud, cap, and bell stages. We're going to be beginning at the bell stage. It's during this stage that the inner enamel epithelial cells differentiate into pre-ameloblasts. This occurs when epithelial plasma membrane proteins called integrins bind to the correct type of fibronectin found in the extracellular matrix. This particular fibronectin is special because it's made by neuromesenchymal stem cells, not our regular mesodermal type of tissue, but the neural crest cells that migrated from the central nervous system to become a special type of mesenchymal stem cell. So it's this fibronectin that induces the formation of pre-ameloblasts. Those pre-ameloblasts are different from the regular old inner enamel epithelium. They begin producing a neuron-like protein on their cell surface called a neurotrophin which is a morphogen. This morphogen is usually expressed in the brain, but it's not entirely strange that it's being expressed here, because after all, the central nervous system differentiated from epithelial cells. So we've got a similar type of thing happening here, epithelial cells becoming a little bit more neuronal. It's this neurotrophin made by the pre-ameloblasts that comes into contact with nearby neuromesenchymal stem cells and induces them to differentiate into odontoblasts and they will begin secreting predentin. We'll cover that process in more detail in the next chapter. At this point the basement membrane just underneath the epithelial layer disintegrates and that allows the pre-ameloblasts to come into contact with that newly formed predentin. That's the first signal. The pre-ameloblasts must also come into contact with signals from the stellate reticulum. And if you get both of those signals, the pre-ameloblasts differentiate into full-blown ameloblasts, and they will begin secreting enamel. So those ameloblasts begin secreting enamel from a structure called Tome's process. Remember, dentin formation had already begun, so the layer of enamel will always be a little bit thinner than the layer of dentin. And Tome's process is, of course, this little bump down here at the bottom of these ameloblasts. The enamel is secreted in an immature state and it mineralizes later as the ameloblasts begin pumping calcium and phosphate which will crystallize within the immature enamel to form the mature material. But at this point we have now formed the dentino enamel junction, uh, contact between enamel and dentin. Enamel is the hardest surface in the human body. It can endure very high amounts of pressure. And as such, it is very difficult to remove. So it takes very specialized cutting tools to remove enamel in the dentist's office. Enamel is thinner in the cervical areas, but it's thicker in places where we generate a lot of force from chewing, most notably here in the cusps. Enamel is mostly inorganic, being made of calcium and phosphate crystals, our friend these calcium hydroxyapatite crystals. A small percentage of enamel is made of protein, only unlike bone tissue, which has collagen as its main protein, enamel is made by epithelial cells and will have different proteins called amelogenins, ameloblastins, and enamelins. 
It is the hard outer surface, which is very good at cutting through food. The dentin underneath is softer and allows for bending. The addition of a softer inner surface to the harder outer surface is very similar to the way that reinforced concrete works. The concrete being hard, whereas the metal component inside allows for more bending. The same is true for harder and softer metals used in katanas and other good cutting implements, like perhaps some of your kitchen knives. Because enamel is harder than dentin and pulp, it shows up as more radio-opaque on an x-ray, whereas the dentin and pulp tissues are more radiolucent. When I told my uncle, the orthodontist, that I was going to be teaching a histology and embryology class for dental hygiene, he remembered Tome's process back from his days in dental school. And that was about it. It's this structure from where enamel is secreted, and it faces the dentino-enamel junction. It's just a small bump on these ameloblasts. So we're going to contrast that in the next chapter with the odontoblastic processes of the odontoblasts. These cells will remain in contact with all of the dentin that they produce, whereas the ameloblasts are only in contact with the most recent layer of enamel that has been formed. When enamel is first produced, it is only partially mineralized. It will be fully mineralized later as the ameloblasts begin pumping more calcium and phosphate into the extracellular matrix where it can crystallize. Because those crystals are hard, the ameloblasts will have to add layer upon layer upon layer. These layers are laid down in a 24 hour cycle, speeding up at night and slowing down during the day. And for that reason, if we cut through a tooth, we can see lines that represent each layer of enamel that was formed in a 24 hour period. And we call those the lines of Retzius. If you squint hard enough, you might see lines running like this here that show the daily addition of a new layer of enamel. Next, we have to keep in mind that each layer of enamel does not completely surround the old one. Teeth are not spheres. They have a more distinct shape. And for that reason, the enamel must be laid down in a more directional fashion. We're not adding the layers completely surrounding the old enamel. And because of that, when the tooth is fully formed, we can see some of these lines between layers at the surface of the tooth. So when a tooth is newly erupted, you may be able to notice the pericamata, or banding on the non-masticatory surfaces of teeth in the oral cavity. These are usually lost through wear and tear over time, except in some of the more protected regions of the oral cavity. If enamel production began over here and the ameloblast with its little tomes process was pushed in this direction as we kept adding another layer and another layer and another layer of enamel, you would see that every ameloblast would produce a single rod of enamel, starting from the dentino enamel junction and extending all the way to the surface of the tooth. So these enamel rods are the crystalline units of enamel, and there are millions of these little rods in each tooth. These rods give rise to the hunter schrager bands. This occurs because the rods are not made in a completely straight line, but they are made at slight angles to one another. This is important because if all of the rods were completely parallel, it would be easier to deliver enough force right along a single point to cause a crack in the tooth. If anybody has ever cut wood, you know that if you swing the ax and land it 
along the lines of the rings of the piece of wood you're trying to cut, you will actually be able to slice through that big chunk of wood, as opposed to if the axe fell perpendicular to those lines. Here in the tooth, there are no perfect parallel lines for an axe blade or really any sort of force to completely break the enamel apart in two. The enamel of the rods is called rod enamel, but there's also enamel produced between the rods. This is important because the density of rod enamel and interrod enamel is not quite the same. Therefore, if you apply an acid to the surface of a tooth, it will dissolve the rod enamel at a different rate from the interrod enamel. And for this reason, that acid will leave the surface of the tooth bumpy rather than creating a smooth, erosive surface. This bumpiness is often taken advantage of prior to adding a sealant to a tooth. It creates more surface area for a sealant to adhere to. Enamel can be lost over time. We call that attrition. It may lead to the rounding of some of the edges of the teeth and loss of the cusps. If enough enamel is lost, that can greatly increase the sensitivity of the teeth for reasons that will become apparent when we learn about the histology of dentin. Under normal circumstances, enamel wears away at roughly eight micrometers per year. But let's say that's eh, close enough to 10 micrometers. So do you know how many micrometers are here in one millimeter? Well, it's a thousand. So how many years would it take to lose a millimeter of enamel if we're losing about 10 millimeters per year? Well, a thousand divided by 10 is a hundred. So it takes about a hundred years or more to lose a millimeter of enamel. So the enamel that we produce is good to go for about a hundred years or more. However, there are some things that can cause enamel to wear away at a faster rate. Bruxism, or grinding of the teeth, abfraction, which is an abnormal amount of friction, or erosion, if we expose this enamel to chemicals that can dissolve the crystals, especially acids from foods, beverages, stomach acid, or bacterial acids. Here are some examples of what acids can do to the mouth. Here in the case of bulimia, stomach acid is left on the teeth after a person vomits repeatedly, and this hydrochloric acid can dissolve the calcium phosphate crystals. In meth mouth, this acid comes from oral bacteria who are, whose population is not being kept in check by adequate production of saliva. So it's bacterial acids that are eroding the teeth here. Abfraction is damage to the tooth by force, not by cavities. And it occurs along the dentino enamel junction. This requires high amounts of tensile forces, but of course the jaws are capable of generating huge amounts of force. Therefore, abfraction often occurs as a result of parafunctional habits, such as the grinding of the teeth. Fluoride can help protect enamel by neutralizing acids made by bacteria and other sources. If that fluoride is administered to a tooth after it erupts, such as by the use of a fluoride toothpaste or a mouthwash, Fluoride can incorporate into the calcium phosphate hydroxyapatite crystals and help protect the outer layers of the tooth, as well as aid in remineralization of the outer surface of the tooth, although this remineral remineralization is fairly slow. However, fluoride can also protect the teeth before they erupt. If it is ingested such as using drops or tablets or treated water, it can be incorporated into enamel as it is produced. And of course, enamel is being produced in the womb. So if mom is exposed to fluoride, 
that fluoride can be incorporated into baby's teeth as they are forming and protect those teeth throughout their lifespan. Acids can demineralize the calcium phosphate hydroxyapatite crystals. As we discussed previously, you might administer acids when you're doing acid etching prior to applying a sealant to a tooth. That creates a bumpy surface on the enamel, which is exactly what bacteria like to hold on to and resist the effects of saliva washing them down into the stomach. So certain oral bacteria will try and demineralize the enamel to create a biofilm which helps to protect the bacteria from saliva. Fluoride, on the other hand, will help to neutralize these acids made by the bacteria. Therefore, they cannot etch the enamel surface. And if that enamel surface is smooth, they cannot create a biofilm. And this helps to allow saliva to wash those bacteria down into the stomach. And thus, this keeps a limit on bacterial populations in the mouth. It doesn't kill them off, but it does limit their growth. And as a result, fluoride, when it's added to drinking water, can reduce cavities by 40% or more. Too much fluoride can lead to dental fluorosis. And many parents don't know exactly how much fluoride toothpaste their children should be using. So this can occur in our younger populations. Dental fluorosis is apparent as whitish spots or streaks on the surface of teeth. Here in the United States, that dental fluorosis should be avoided, but this is mainly a cosmetic change to the teeth, not a sign of illness. Still, you should caution parents to use the correct amount of fluoride-containing toothpaste. Fluoride has been extensively studied by scientific means. And it's been found that fluoride is not linked to any form of cancer. Nor is fluoride linked to any sort of bone disease. Fluoride also does not increase the uptake of lead or arsenic. And fluoride was not used by Hitler to control the population of Nazi Germany. These are all lies that have been used to try and scare people away from the use of fluoride containing compounds or to add fluoride to drinking water. That doesn't make fluoride completely safe, but nothing's completely safe. It's the dose that makes the poison. It is possible to poison yourself with water. Drowning is an obvious example, but water toxicity does exist even if it's rare. Too much water can kill somebody. Too much fluoride, similarly, should be avoided. There's a correct safe dose where it's effective, and we really should be aiming for that dose. More doesn't make it better. In fact, that just increases the chances of deleterious side effects. A report did come out a few years ago that showed that fluoride was linked to reduced IQ. So, this falls along the lines that fluoride can be neurotoxic. But this is at really high doses. Really high doses of anything are neurotoxic. And please believe me, I used to grow neurons in petri dishes. If you added a little too much water or just looked at them funny, those neurons tended to die. They're very delicate little cells. Too much zinc, too much calcium, too much magnesium, all of those things can kill a neuron. That doesn't mean we should avoid zinc, calcium, or magnesium. We should get the correct dose and not expose ourselves to too much of those metals. But this one particular study done by Harvard looking at children in China showed that in regions that had really high levels of fluoride, they saw a reduction in the average IQ of those children compared to others of about seven points. Plus or minus 15, so that's a pretty high variability. But this is not insignificant here. 
The problems that I have with this study is that IQ is just one measurement of brain health. It measures the brain's ability to solve puzzles. And some people are better at this than others. In fact, some people on the autism spectrum are really good at solving puzzles, but score much lower on something called an EQ test or an emotional quotient test. But that wasn't tested here, just IQ. So this result here could be consistent with fluoride protecting against autism, but I don't believe that's the case. Still, the bigger problem here was the dose. These doses of fluoride were 10 to 20 times higher than what is allowed here in the drinking water in the United States. That would be like saying, well, if drinking one glass of wine per night is okay, then drinking 20 glasses should be 20 times as okay. And we know that's not the case. 20 glasses of wine is definitely bad for people. But if 20 glasses of wine are bad for people every day, that doesn't make one glass of wine bad for you. So we need to pay attention to these doses. So if you have any parents who read some of the summaries of this article, that fluoride may cause damage to the brain, you might bring up that the dosage was completely wrong and they really only measured one aspect of brain health. This was not a holistic approach to measuring the quality of somebody's brain. On the other side, how effective is fluoride? Well, I already mentioned that when it's added to drinking water here in the United States, it can reduce the number of cavities in that population by 40%. One argument against the use of fluoride is that when Norway removed fluoride from their drinking water, they did not see an increase in dental cavities. However, Norway has something that we don't have, universal health care. They have dental hygienists going into their schools, applying fluoride directly to the teeth of every child. And that's not something that we do here in the United States. There are a lot of children, especially poor children, who do not get adequate dental care. So adding fluoride to the drinking water is a good way to be more equitable in our distribution of health care. When added to the drinking water, everybody gets it not just the children of rich parents. As a result, the CDC has ranked water fluoridation as one of our top 10 public health advancements, along with vaccines and seat belts and anti-smoking campaigns. The Kaiser Foundation agrees that dental caries are the number one chronic illness in children here in the United States. One in four kids have untreated tooth decay. And that's because, well, many of them do not have access to dental insurance. So should anybody else care besides the dentists and dental hygienists? Well, absolutely. Even if you didn't care about your teeth, which you should, obviously, those oral bacteria, if they're allowed to get into the blood supply through dental cavities into the pulp, then into the blood vessels, those oral bacteria cause inflammation in the circulatory system and increases the risk of heart failure twofold. And that's very significant because it's heart disease that's going to kill most people. So your patients need to keep their gums healthy and prevent bleeding during flossing or brushing. Because otherwise, opening the oral cavity to the bloodstream allows those oral bacteria to get to places where they shouldn't be. There's many bacteria that we actually like having in the oral cavity. They're just fine there. They can outcompete some bad bacteria. But those good oral bacteria become bad once they get into the blood. So we need to keep a barrier between the blood and oral bacteria at all times. And that means healthy enamel, and healthy gingiva. Enamel has no color, but it can absorb molecules that have color. So that is tooth staining. 
That usually occurs in the interprismatic areas, the space between the prisms. And that can cause a tooth to appear darker or more yellowish. As a result, your patients may come to you or may search out over-the-counter products to whiten the teeth. Some of those products are safer than others. Some are bleaches when, if used in the right amount for the right amount of time, can whiten the teeth safely. Others are a little bit less safe, things that are abrasive and just wear away the stained portion, then unmasking the fresher underlying portions of enamel. This is generally not so healthy because it involves loss of enamel. So that's going to bring us to the last section of this lecture, which is to consider developmental disturbances in enamel formation. After all, that is kind of the topic of this class. The first is enamel hypoplasia. Just looking at this name, we should know exactly what the symptom is. Hypo means too little and plasia means growth. So there are a number of things that can lead to a reduction in the amount of enamel that is formed. One common one is for a pregnant female to have syphilis. This disease produces a chemical that can act as a teratogen that reduces the ability of enamel to form. Hence, any children born to mothers who have syphilis are at a much higher risk for enamel hypoplasia than others. Another can be if that mother has celiac disease, especially if it's bad during her pregnancy. Celiac disease can cause a number of nutrients to not be absorbed properly. And if that happens for calcium, if there's not enough calcium around, then there won't be enough enamel formed. Similarly, other diseases can lead to enamel hypoplasia, such as measles and chickenpox, which is why it's important for everybody who's around a pregnant female to be properly immunized. Any of these things will just reduce the amount of enamel that is formed during that first trimester of pregnancy. And as a result, when the teeth finally erupt later in life, they will appear with pitted and grooved surfaces. Next is a condition called amelogenesis imperfecta, which can affect all of the teeth. The enamel is very thin and tends to chip off. It's possible that no enamel may be on the tooth surface at all. But because of the chipping, teeth are much more likely to undergo severe amounts of attrition. Amelogenesis imperfecta is a genetic condition. Some forms are recessive, some forms are dominant. There are a number of genes that when mutated can lead to amelogenesis imperfecta. Many of these genes are known to be associated with this condition, but their functions aren't known. Listed here are three genes that when mutated, we know it leads to amelogenesis imperfecta, and we also know the functions of these genes. The first is a matrix metalloprotease. We've discussed some of these elsewhere. This particular one helps to dissolve extracellular matrix crystals, in this case, enamel crystals, and then allows those crystals to reform in a nice organized fashion. For instance, those hunter schrager bands. Next are genes for these three proteins. These are the proteins found in the extracellular matrix of enamel, the amelogenins, ameloblastins, and enamelins. Remember, enamel is made by epithelial cells. We can think of these proteins as the cousins of collagen, but they're different. They serve the same function, but collagen is a protein normally made by mesodermal derivatives, whereas enamel is an ectodermal derivative. Our third gene is laminin, one of those basement membrane proteins that the inner enamel epithelium had to come into contact with to differentiate into a pre-ameloblast. Take away that signal, 
and now you don't form enough ameloblasts. Lastly, another condition is the exact opposite, where too much enamel is formed. It's possible for some cells to differentiate into ameloblasts in the wrong place, such as here in the root of the tooth. Rather than forming cementum, these cells have formed a little bit of enamel in the form of an enamel pearl. This may be mistaken for calculus, but you're not going to be able to scrape this away. So be careful and learn to recognize what an enamel pearl feels like.